In the pre-dawn hours of August 1, 1982, the heart of Kenya's political landscape pulsated with an audacious rhythm as a group of dissatisfied lower-ranking Air Force officers embarked on a daring endeavor that would etch its mark on the nation's history. The air crackled with tension as the stage was set for a coup d'etat, a dramatic plot twist in Kenya's political narrative. As the rebels seized key installations and the radio waves crackled with fiery declarations, the fate of the government of President Daniel Arab Moy hung in precarious balance. In this episode of African Biographics, we cover the story of Kenya's bloody abortive coup of 1 August 1982 as well as its aftermath. After the death of Mzee Jomo Kenyatta, the first president of independent Kenya, and in accordance with the constitution, Vice President Daniel Toroitich Arab Moy acceded to the presidency on 22 August 1978. When he came to power, Daniel Arab Moy pledged to root out corruption among the ruling elite, one of the running sores of Kenyan political life. Unfortunately, there was little evidence he had any success and some observers said the problem of corruption had grown worse. The wider background was of declining living standards in Kenya with an increasing population size that was causing strain on urban resources as well as high figures of unemployment, underemployment and crime. In addition, in the early 1980s, weak international markets left the tea and coffee industries, which at the time accounted for about 30% of Kenya's foreign exchange earnings in the doldrums. Inflation was running at about 20% and for the first time, Kenya had to go hat in hand to the International Monetary Fund for emergency funds to keep the economy afloat. Criticism by some university students and lecturers in 1982 called into question Kenya's economic system and its relations with multinational corporations and Western governments. In turn, President Arab Moy felt particularly threatened by these notions that were emanating from the university, describing such opinions as treason. Supposedly, one of the triggers for the abortive coup was the June 1982 amendment of the constitution that made Kenya officially a one-party state. In this instance, President Moy had moved quickly to legalize the country's one-party system after long-time opposition leader Oginga Odinga talked about forming a socialist party. For all practical purposes, Kenya had been a one-party state for years, but parliament made it official that June of 1982. Consequently, the grumbles from university students and the lecturers as well as the other more educated sectors of society became more amplified after that. Because of this, President Moy, who had expressed paranoia about coup cool plots and Marxist elements, especially within the university, launched a crackdown on dissent. He jailed 11 prominent Kenyans, the first political prisoners in Kenya since he came to power in 1978. These prisoners included lecturers from the University of Nairobi, which was considered a hotbed of radical socialist opposition. The short, chaotic coup attempt of 1 August 1982 would take place in this context of the alarming disintegration of Kenya's economic well-being and political stability. One of the main leaders of the abortive coup was senior private Hezekiah Ochuka, a low-ranking military officer in the Kenya Air Force. About a month prior, Ochuka had held a secret meeting at the football grounds near Umoja Estate and details of how the coup was to be executed were discussed at this particular meeting. Apparently during this meeting, Ochuka told the attendees that he had the support of Uganda, Tanzania and Sudan who would send their soldiers to the borders to counter in opposition once the coup had been set in motion. He went further to allege that he had the blessings of Russia who would send a Soviet ship to the Kenyan coast to help him against any external interference. But it is widely believed that Ochuka had made up all these stories to convince his recruits to take up this risky mission. One wonders why it was officers from the Air Force in particular who decided to stage this coup. As one theory goes, prior to the coup attempt, the composition of the Kenya Air Force differed from the Army in the higher educational level of its members. Most Air Force officers were university graduates and the higher educational level of Air Force members as well as the links of many to the university explain why they were more politicized than those of the Army. The uprising of August 1982 predominantly involved junior officers of the Air Force. 
Very few senior officers appear to have been involved, and it was apparently timed to coincide with a period when most of the Kenyan army was on maneuvers near Lake Turkana in the northwest. Kenya's president, Daniel Arab Moy, was apparently at his country home at Kabarak, 120 miles north of Nairobi. It is also widely believed that both the Kenyan Special Branch and Kenyan military intelligence were aware of a brewing mutiny. James Kanyotu, the head of Special Branch, had been aware of the plans for the mutiny but had failed to get permission from President Moy to arrest the suspected conspirators before they launched the coup. At around 3 a.m. on August 1, 1982, under the Shroud of Darkness, the coup attempt got underway with the takeover of Eastley Air Base just outside Nairobi. By 4 a.m., the nearby Embakasi Air Base had also fallen. As dawn approached, the echoes of gunfire reverberated throughout the capital, punctuating the stillness of the morning. Nairobi, once draped in the tranquility of slumber, was now thrust into the throes of a coup in progress. The first word of the coup attempt came at around 6 a.m. when Leonardo Mambombotela, one of Kenya's best-known announcers, made a statement in Swahili. Mbotela had been whisked in the dead of the night from his Ngara house to the studio to read the infamous radio announcement at gunpoint. Around the same time, Private Hezekiah Ochuka and one sergeant, Pancras Oteo Okumu, who was also said to have been an instigator of the coup, appeared at the Voice of Kenya radio station in central Nairobi, where they broadcast in English and Swahili that the military had taken power. These rebels declared the establishment of the People's Redemption Council and accused the government of corruption, tribalism, and oppressive rule. Private Ochuka and his crew claimed that the coup was aimed at addressing these perceived injustices and creating a more equitable and just society. Eyewitnesses at a communication center that had been taken over by the rebels and others who were in central Nairobi when these anti-government forces were in control said they saw men dressed in army uniform helping the Air Force personnel consolidate their early gains. But the higher echelons of the army, however, remained loyal to the president. It soon became clear that this coup attempt to overthrow the established order in Kenya lacked the precision and coordination that typically accompany well-orchestrated endeavors. For instance, the officers captured the national radio, which as you know is a requirement for all coups, but they could not find any martial music to broadcast. As a result, the brief chants of power in the streets were accompanied by the reggae tunes of Bob Marley and Jim Cliff which were playing on radio. The rebels also only took the radio studios and neglected to attack the transmitting facilities, so the plug was soon pulled. Lacking army support, the rebels had no armor or heavy arms to take and hold key installations. Remember, a successful coup often requires broad-based support to effectively challenge the existing order. In this case, probably the Air Force rebels simply believed that they could proclaim power and that the masses, supposedly fed up with President Moy, would rise to their support and force the army onto their side. With the exception of some university students, the civilian population was not involved in this coup d'etat. But the urban poor did however go on to take advantage of the breakdown in law and order in Nairobi to engage in looting. Civilians looted stores throughout Nairobi. Eyewitnesses said some looters smashed windows of automobile showrooms and store cars. Some people balanced boxes of stolen groceries, electrical appliances, and furniture on their heads while evading policemen on streets that were strewn with shattered glass and broken limbs of store window mannequins. Drunk soldiers were also seen commandeering or stealing civilian cars to transport their loot. Reportedly, there was a hilarious case of the soldier who removed his uniform outside a fashion store to try out the suits inside only to find his uniform and gun gone. This abortive coup cost merchants more than $50 million in damages in Nairobi alone. Some merchants were cleaned out of everything, including plumbing fixtures and light bulbs. Some shopkeepers who survived the looting would boost their prices by as much as 50%. By 10 o'clock in the morning, about six hours after the rebels had taken control, the government counter-attack was well underway. 
The Kenyan military counterattack was led by Brigadier General Mahmoud Mohammed. The general played a crucial role in coordinating the loyalist forces and orchestrating the government's response to quell the rebellion. Under his leadership, with the help of the General Service Unit and later the regular police, the government forces swiftly moved to regain control of key installations. Fierce fighting raged on the streets of Nairobi, with corpses left on the streets. Among the many victims were students who the rebels had urged to demonstrate in favor of the coup. Now, as the counter-attack was happening, Sergeant Okumu was not sure about who was involved and who was fighting who. He was then immediately informed that it was actually the army infantry who were enacting a counter-offensive. It was at this point that Sergeant Okumu and Private Ezekai Ochuka decided to flee and found two pilots who were ready to fly them. Even then, they were not sure where they were going. As they came into land at Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, the four men were captured and they were questioned by the local police. Meanwhile, back in Nairobi, the government forces had already stormed the broadcasting station and had killed or captured the rebel soldiers that were inside. Hours later, President Daniel Arab Moy broadcast to the nation after this abortive coup attempt and he thanked army leaders and their men for their total loyalty to him and to the government as well as to the people of Kenya. Unfortunately, in the few hours that this attempted overthrow was taking place, hundreds of people had been killed and thousands were detained, including most members of the Air Force. Hospitals reported that more than 50 people, mainly civilians, had been treated for gunshot wounds. Despite the chaos that had ensued, and after a few days of fear and uncertainty, much of it caused by the violence of the looting mob in Nairobi, Kenya was once again remarkably normal. In the end, the coup d'etat collapsed under the weight of its own disarray. A court process that started on August 19 would grant the officers Okumu and Ochuka asylum in Tanzania. But their joy was short-lived as they were brought back to Kenya for trial. During the trials of the men, the name of Oginga Odinga was mentioned several times as having financed the organizers. As such, Oginga Odinga was placed under house arrest. His son, Raila Odinga, together with other university lecturers, were sent to detention after being charged for treason, an accusation which was later dropped. After a lengthy court-martial, senior private Hezekiah Ochuka was hanged alongside his conspirators, Sergeant Okumu, Sergeant Joseph Ogidi, Corporals Charles Oriwa, Walter Ojode, and Bramwell Jereman. In the end, a total of 12 people had been sentenced to death and over 900 were jailed. Meanwhile, in the aftermath of the coup, President Daniel Arab Moy became a changed man and he grew more paranoid. The president cautiously pulled back from his usual involvement with close political allies. Cabinet meetings were suspended and his ministers found it harder to gain an audience with him. The university came in for retaliation as well. President Moy had always been uneasy about the intelligentsia and saw the students' involvement on August 1, although apparently unpremeditated, gave him an excuse to launch a crackdown. On 2 August 1982, the government closed the university indefinitely. An unknown number of students were arrested and taken off to various police stations for interrogation. Following the coup attempt, the Kenyan Air Force was disbanded and a new Air Force was organized called the 82 Air Force and made a branch of the army. Indeed, the bloody abortive coup of 1 August 1982 left an indelible mark on the nation of Kenya, shaping its political trajectory and resonating through the corridors of power for years to come. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been Tatenda for African Biographics. Until next time, cheers. Have a good one.